So uh, chapter five is basically resampling methods, including bootstrap, of course, and then how to validate your model. So basically you built this model, classification, regression, how good is it, you know, on a, a new set of data. Um, however, we don't always have the ability to get a new set of data. So there are ways that we can validate um, using our original set to get an idea of how good our model is <coughs> in the real world. Um, so learning objectives for this chapter are validation set to estimate the test error um, using leave one out or LOOCV um, for short, also using K-fold and bootstrap. And then we want, also want to do a kind of a compare and contrast of the advantages and disadvantages of various methods. Also, the good news is, well, to me it was good news, but um, this chapter is quite a bit shorter than chapter three and four. Um, it was kind of a nice little breather, breather I guess. So I, I think we'll probably get through everything through 5.2, which is bootstrap um, today, but we'll see, we'll see where we end up. Okay, so let's kick it off with the validation set approach. This is basically randomly splitting the data into a training set, which you use to estimate your model, and then a validation set or a test set. I just wanted to make a note, this was not in the book per se, uh, but time series analysis, it's not always feasible to randomly spit, split the data. Um, there are ways to do validation set approach from what I have read, if you have very long time series in terms of holding, having certain ones that are trading, and then you use that to predict the future for certain ones that are test, but that's not really in the scope of this book. Um, the, the percent that was given in the book, I believe is 50-50 for training set validation set. Um, I've seen other places, 20%, 30% um, validation <laughs> set. Um, Jonathan, did you want to say something? Okay, I just <laughs> heard you clear in your throat. Um, yeah, if, anyways, also feel free to jump in anytime if you want to bring something up. Um, definitely will not offend me to pause the presentation. So basically, the point is you do some kind of split depending on your problem. Let's just say 50 50 for, since that's what the book is saying. Okay, so um, this, the advantage of the validation set approach is very conceptually simple, right? You split the data, one's for training, one's for validation. Um, the validation error rate, so what is the error rate for that validation, comparing that validation set to your model that you estimate and those predicted values, depends on basically the assignment of the points, the, the data observations into the training and validation set. So you can get a lot of variation in that validation error rate depending on the random split. Also, um, a disadvantage is that we are giving up valuable data points by not using all of the data to estimate the model. So this means that the validation error rate is going to tend to overestimate our test error, the true test theoretical test error rate. I included this graphic um, because I, I thought it was an interesting illustration of the points that we were just discussing. So on the left, you see a polynomial, I believe this was a regression, yeah, for the predicting MPG as a polynomial function of horsepower. So the mean squared error, which was the, um, the measure of accuracy used in this case, kind of definitely goes down from one to two degree polynomial and then kind of more or less stays the same, goes down a little bit as we go up to crazy high degrees of polynomial. I mean, I don't know who's ever going to use a 10 degree polynomial. I, I Theoretically, I'm sure there are applications, but if you find yourself doing that, maybe reconsider your approach. Um, and then we can see all the, the validation, the estimated test error or the validation um, errors really depend a lot on the validation and training sets used. So the process was repeated, I don't know, 10, 20 different times. And in different scenarios, you might choose different degree of polynomial. 
um, we do kind of see a pattern of the um, big big decrease from uh, one degree to two degrees. So it's not, the point of this is, even though there's a lot of variation in that test error rate, there still is a use for a validation set approach. Okay, the next method, which addresses some of the disadvantages of um, the validation set approach is leave one out cross validation, L-O-O-C-B. So as mentioned before, you get a lot of variation. So we do have the same kind of splitting the data into a training set and a validation set. However, the validation set includes just one observation and then the training set includes the N minus one observations. So we repeat this process um, for all observations such that the, uh, you have N models estimated. So the advantages of this method are that having a large training set avoids the problems from not using all or technically almost all of the data and estimating the model. However, we do have um, the validation error for any given model of these end models is highly variable. It only consists of one observation, but it is unbiased. So at the bottom of the screen, you can see the LOOCV estimate of the test error rate, and that's averaged, of course, over the 10 models. So it's, it's a simple um, summate, summation. So we're going to go a little bit more into some of the advantages of a validation set approach. Um, as mentioned previously, less bias since models are fitted, repeatedly fitted on somewhat different data sets, I should say slightly different data sets. Um, so we don't have, tend to have the same problem with overestimating the test error. Um, and then of course, when you perform LOCV, that estimated test error, that summation is going to be the same because you have the entire data set used. So the major disadvantage is that it is computationally expensive. So obviously you're estimating N different models. As N gets higher, it's a lot of computational resources. Um, and kind of as an aside for time series, uh, there is an approach that is used, obviously you have to keep in mind the sequential nature of time series where you estimate the model on the increasingly bigger data sets and then you might have it one step ahead or it could be, you might be interested in like the three step ahead observation and then computing, um, computing those errors, summing them up. There is a shortcut to estimate what would the LOOCV test error be for linear polynomial regression models. So basically not um, classification. And that is as follows. Um, you'll notice it's similar to the, the cross-validation statistic we saw earlier. The H sub I is the leverage for a given residual as defined in equation 3.37. Truth be told, I considered putting this in the notes. And then I was like, eh, it's a pretty long equation and I didn't want to fool around with it. So. You can go look at it for yourself if you are curious and keep in mind that the um, equation for 3.37 in the book is for a simple linear regression. So if you have multiple linear regression, it will be different, but you should be able to get that from your our output, I believe. So the value of H falls between one and one over N. So if you think about it, observations whose residual is higher leverage will contribute relatively more when we consider that average that is going on there to the CV statistic. So LOOCV also has the advantage, which actually is probably not really an advantage, but you can use it for logistic regression, LDA, QDA, basically all the different kinds of models we've looked at um, previously. Okay, the next uh, cross-validation method is K-fold. So I kind of, um, to use a nursery rhyme or a nursery tale analogy, if we think about the story of Goldilocks and the three bears, right? It's like this porridge is too hot, too cold, just right. I don't wanna say that K-fold is just right because there are cases where validation set versus leave one out would be better, but it's kind of intermediate in between 
estimating those n models, right? But leave one out and then one model with the validation set approach. So it's an alternative to LOCV. You divide the data set into K groups, AKA folds. That's where um, the name comes from. And they have approximately equal size or let's just say equal size. The percent of the data that is in the validation set can be thought of as one over K. So if you have K groups, you have 20% of the data will be withheld for testing. I really liked this graphic from the book. Um, so you have at the top in that white rectangle, you have one, you know, the different observations, one, two, three, up, up to N. Um, and then you can see there's different, there's, uh, this is a five-fold um, split. And every observation gets the opportunity to be in that validation set. And if you think about it, um, LOCV is a special case of K fold where K equals N. Okay, so the advantages of LOCV over K fold, obviously computationally, you're just, you're estimating your models doing, you know, if you um, computing for your test errors. Uh, there are other advantages related to the good old bias variance trade-off that we've been talking about since chapter two. Um, the figure below is a really good illustration um, to just kind of show some of the relationship between for those simulated data sets that we looked at in chapter two. I think, I can't remember the figure they were in, but you can go back and review chapter two if you don't remember what we're talking about. So let me scroll down here. I'm having a little hard time with that. So you see on the left, have, oh gosh. Let's see if I can page down. For some reason I have a little bit of a hard time with that. Okay. So you see on the left, I believe the blue is the true test error. So this would shoot, this is, if I remember correctly, the flexibility of the model. So based on the, what the true test error would be, you would choose a model of this flexibility. But K-fold is, one of these is K-fold, one of these is LOCV. Um, you can see in this case, they, they would choose, they would both lead you to choose a somewhat more flexible model than you would knowing the true test error. But um, it's not a lot different. Um, in this case, um, we see, again, the same thing, not a lot different. Interestingly, going back to this one over here, we tend to underestimate the true test error. Here, it's about the same. And then in this data set, both if we do the true test error and then based on the validation set approaches of KFOLD and LOCB, we would choose a somewhat more flexible model. Okay. So as we previously mentioned, validation approach tends to overestimate. Um, there is low variance in the estimate because obviously we're just doing one estimate of the test error. LOCV has little bias since almost all observations are used to create the models. Um, and then the point in the book, they didn't really go into this a lot, but the mean of the highly correlated N models, obviously the N models would be highly correlated because they're used on almost the same data set, has higher variance. Um, LOCV mean estimated error has a higher variance. So the K-fold method, assuming K is less than N, suffers from intermediate bias and variance levels. To go back to um, the Goldilocks illustration, um, and then they don't go into this in the book a lot, but it's mentioned that K equals five, K equals 10 is often used in modeling um, since it has been demonstrated to yield results that do not have either too much bias or too much variance. Can you say, I don't understand that sub bullet, um, since the mean of the highly correlated N models has a higher variance. I read that sentence like 10 times in the book. Yeah. And I it wasn't don't super understand clear to me. it. It wasn't super clear to me either. I I mean, if I have more time and you know, not trying to do 
two people's jobs at work kind of thing, maybe I look into it, but um, I think we're probably all that everybody's busy, right? My guess is they were kind of glossing over it because this is intro to statistical learning and it's not the elements, the more theoretical approach. Um, but yeah, it was a little bit of a counterintuitive sentence to me. I mean, I kind of thought about it. I was like, okay, maybe, but um, if somebody wants to comment on that and give us a more theoretical underpinning that that I'd be interested to hear that. I'm not looking at the chat right now since I'm presenting, but uh, maybe there's some links in the chat that we can check out later. Uh, there is a question to discuss on how do we decide on the K, um, which I think August pretty much answered it. It's kind of a choice. You just, it is a uh, choice, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, I mean, there's there's some impact of the size of your data set. Like you can get more folds out of mm -hmm. uh, a larger data set, but yeah, I don't know. Like they, you know, they say five or ten is good. Um, yeah, they don't really go into it all. They're just like <laughs> five or ten is good. So I almost felt like in this chapter, I'm curious to hear what other people's impressions were, but they were kind of glossing over a few more things than they were with like the other chapters. Um, and maybe that's just my. Maybe that's just because I pre am presenting this chapter that I'm like, well, you guys could have gone into this and this and this and this. And maybe they just felt like, eh, it's our intro book. Check out the elements book if you want to have more detail. But um, yeah, it was kind of like, okay, K equals five. So that's the polls be the sweet spot. But between K equals five and K equals 10, we, why not K equals six? Why not K equals seven, right? I mean, you can kind of, it brings up a lot of questions, I guess. So for me, I either do five or 10 because they told me to. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then the, the final decision is just how long stuff takes to run. So with, with the more folds, if the computation is, you know, an hour, then yeah. you go with the smaller number of folds. That's yeah, the probably not the best, but... k is interesting to me because I do a lot of time series stuff, like almost exclusively. And... So leave one out, like I have done that, that kind of stuff. There's a really easy function in the Fable package, I believe, that um, you can do that, you know, and you can do your, your cross-validation error. You have to start with a minimum data set that you need to estimate your model, right? And you kind of increase it. But oh my goodness, it takes a long, you know, time to run. And uh, yeah, it, it is computational. Um, expensiveness is certainly a, a real consideration, so. Um, that kind of, yeah, like I think I do 10, unless 10 is going to take too long, and then I do five. I think <laughs> you kind of hit on the, yeah. the decision, and that's there, as much there, thought as I put into it, I think. Th there's an art to this. I mean, <laughs> I think a lot of people, when they're starting out, they're like, oh, this is the right way to do it. You know, it's like, yes, but... You know, I was talking about, the, um, about that with my boss yesterday, and uh, I was like, yeah, I'm doing this book club, and, you know, sometimes I'm thinking, yeah, that's the right way to do it, but, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, when you're also going back to student days, um, you kind of think you learn a certain way, then you get out and practice, and it's not always done that way, so it is interesting. Okay, well, I'll move along. And, and if anybody has any other thoughts, uh, feel free to jump in. Just, I do not mind shutting up for a while. <laughs> okay, so cross-validation on classification problems. So mean squared error is more of a use, which they've been using because it is kind of a common, commonly used um, error measurement. That's more of a, th that is really relevant in the regression context. So for classification problems, we can use the cross-validation methods. Um, there's a slight change to the formula. As you can see, the error is defined as basically where does our predicted value not meet the actual value? Okay, so logistic polynomial regression. I liked this, and we'll see if this will let me scroll down. Oops, it will not. 
So you're so let's see if I can remember what this was. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, so you have different degrees of polynomial. This is logistic polynomial regression. So we have our um, base decision boundary here in the purple, degrees one, two, three, and four. And so degree one, and then we see degree two, it's a little more flexible. And then for those of you who might be following along and can actually scroll down, degree three and four are about the same. Does it work if um, you use your arrow keys to? Yeah, for some reason, let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay, I, must, I wasn't just, thank you for that. I wasn't going over. This is great. Now I don't have to remember what I put on this, this section. Thank you very much. Um, so you, you get to degrees three and four, right? And you can see how it's approx it's getting closer to that Bayes decision boundary. Um, and this is the simulated data, I believe, from chapter two, if I remember correctly. So the true test error rate, obviously, in practice and Bayes error rate are unknown. This is simulated data, so it's a good illustration. And so we have this nice little illustration down here of K-fold cross-validation compared to our, the test error rate, the training error rate, which is in blue, kind of does go up, but it does continue to go down, right? And then here it just falls to zero. And then tenfold is in um, black. So you see that the t in, if we were using tenfold cross-validation, we would um, choose a four-degree polynomial, really three is actually the best, but not a big difference, probably not hugely impactful for Raleigh specified. And then this is one over K, right? So as K um, decreases, you're going to go over closer to one. Obviously, here would be K equals one for the K nearest neighbors. Um, again, slightly different results there. So this is K at N classification. I don't know if I mentioned that. Okay. So now we're moving on to 5.2, Bootstrap. Bootstrap can be used in a wide variety of modeling frameworks. You can, for example, estimating the uncertainty associated with a given estimator. Um, so you can estimate the standard errors of coefficient, useful for parametric, non-parametric methods. So the idea of a bootstrap is basically repeated sampling with replacement from the original data set. So you can form a distribution of the statistic in question. And it's really useful when, obviously, in, in the ideal situation, we'd love to just go be able to repeatedly sample the population and build up you know, distribution that way. But a lot of times, we have one sample. That's what we're stuck with. OK, so this is a, um, a helpful graphic to kind of understand this concept. The example in the book that was given was minimizing the, vari the variance of an investment in terms of the return. So you're choosing alpha, which is the proportion that is allocated to, I think, investment X versus investment Y. And you can read up on that in the book if, if you haven't already. So this is on the left, you have 1,000 samples that were generated from the true population. The pink line shows that estimate of the mean of alpha is around 0.6. Bootstrap distribution is in the middle. So you have a thousand samples. Again, the key here being replacement taken from the original sample. Um, notice that both the confidence, both confidence intervals here in our box plot on the right contain the true alpha, so that pink line in the right panel. And you can see the spread of the distributions is similar, slightly larger for the bootstrap. Okay, and then they just they just kind of threw out this formula here, um, the bootstrap standard error. Um, keep in mind this B is not beta. It's, it's basically standard error bootstrap of um, just alpha hat, which was the example in the book. You can obviously adjust it to whatever, you know, whatever you're estimating. Um, so you basically, it's plug it in. You can get this kind of output from R, right? But it's kind of useful to know how it, um, how it is constructed. I'm trying to remember there. Um, so yeah, R equals one. So that's, that's your index. Not sure why they chose R. And oh, also equivalent pick with book, the R dash that they use or 
I, I don't know why they do. I just changed that to J because that maybe it just made me feel better about the whole situation. So it's slightly different from what you'll see in the book, just a heads up. Um, and I think that it, yes, that is everything. Okay, so I see there's a lot on the chat. Any questions, comments, corrections, thoughts? I'll then I'll speak at once. That was really good. I, I liked your uh, presentation of that. Thank you. Well done. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I feel think like I had, uh... a, I had an easy one compared to for the folks before. <laughs> I mean, because I, I was like, well, I could try to put more in there, but there's just not much more. So I was like, well, maybe everybody will appreciate just kind of a more, hey, you know, we have 13 sections instead of like the deluge of information they <laughs> gave us in chapter three and four. So, I, I'm, I have a question more out of curiosity than sure. I care, need to know. But since you have a lot of time series expertise, how would the bootstrap method, if at all, be applied to time series? To be honest, we, well, what I'm telling you is from my company, there's a lot of things we could do okay. better. Okay. We don't, we do not do that, you know? I mean, I'm sure that you can be done. Maybe August, I believe August is also, I've seen him on the supply chain channel. Um, he might have some thoughts about that. Not trying to put you on the spot, August, but, uh, or some other people, but I, I haven't really thought about it that um i mean i guess depending on what you were trying to estimate if you were like you could probably do it i mean if you were looking at like i don't know i have to sit down and think about a context and which that would be applicable but i i mean if you're doing a regression model i guess on a, a time series like a co you know you obviously you can use that for standard error estimates that kind of thing but i don't know See, see if anybody else has anything they want to add about that. Looks like not. <laughs> Looks like the, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone have any other thoughts about this? I, could, I can add to the um, to the Bayesian stuff. Um, it's not as good as using an RNN. Basically, it would be the would be the straightforward uh, argument I would make in our company. In fact, we actually used to use Bayesian models, um, and the reason why we don't use them anymore is just because they're not as accurate. It's really that simple. Um, <clears throat> they also do take quite a long time to process, um, but they do come with the benefit of calculating very good um, confidence interval, and in that respect, they are quite strong. They're certainly better than uh, what I would say, better than linear regression in many cases, but not all. Um, th they suffer from the same problem of the sparsity of data as well. Um, but I mean, there's lots of different ways of doing using Bayesian models in time series. Um, and I believe that the model time people did something recently, Bayes factor, was it called? Yeah, I've seen um, model time stuff. I haven't checked out that package yet, but I'm uh it's it looked very interesting. My company suffers from the problem of not having a lot of data. I always when I see people like, oh, I have all this data, it's like lucky you, because that's not my situation. So the, the, yeah, I mean it, it, time series I, suffer a lot from um from uh, from quantities over time. Um I, uh, with, with Bayesian, I think the thing is, we, at the moment, we're doing regression uh, of stories on one of the other channels, and the main benefit of uh, of of Bayesian modeling is to be able to better calculate a, um, a normative distribution, and that is the reason for the, well, not always, but uh, what we'd call a normal distribution. The main reason for that is so that you can get better predictive accuracy accuracy and, and and also understanding the confidence interval because it's about the Bayesian thinking approach which is when we are making a prediction how confident are we that that prediction is good and that can be useful in time series and um, to the point where if you look at like say um, profit profit is basically a Bayesian structural time series and what that essentially means is 
that they use that in order to kind of work out the change points as to when data goes up or down. Um, so it, it, it does, it is quite useful in that. And if you watch, um, if, you, if you look at the uh, structure of profit when it's running, it will show you the, um, it will show you the, uh, MC, the Monte Carlo chains being, uh, being, uh, being calculated. And that's how it kind of, that's part of how it works is that it's an internal system. There are different ways of doing that process and utilizing um, utilizing this kind of simulation idea within time series. The problem is, is that actually when you do simulate time series, often you're not simulating the exact same structure of it. And that's, that's your main problem overall. Anyway, uh, sorry, I'll just talk for too long. <laughs> I think we could do a whole chapter on that. I honestly, this is obviously my bias, but I wish there were more specific time series exam. I know this book isn't about that, but it'd be nice to see uh, a little bit more of that. But I know there are other books out there in the R space. If you want to do, uh, what's it, forecasting principles and practices. I'm oh yeah, I, d I literally use the tidy verts for, we do, we forecast at my company. I work for a pharm pharmaceutical company. Um, we forecast all almost 1,000 DFU, or we call them demand forecast units, but it's our level we forecast at using that. And it, it works pretty well. I mean, we don't get great accuracy just using like the univariate methods. We were, I'm trying to do other stuff with that in terms of like, okay, what are some data that are correlated and we're a little too cheap to pay for the really good data? Um, just being honest, mm -hmm. <laughs> real life problems, right? So mm -hmm. um, that would probably correlate very well, but um, yeah, I mean, you can you can get okay or de decent results with that kind of thing. So, mm. um, I I would highly recommend Model Time. It is basically the tidy models version of Time Series, and it takes okay. five minutes forecast practically. And the problem with uh, with Fable is that it's really good for individual forecasts, but it doesn't. I don't find it to be as easy to work with when I'm trying to build a lot of models and compare lots of different modeling strategies. Um, whereas yeah. model time is a lot quicker because it utilizes that kind of system of recipes and uh, testing and hyperparameters. Um, yeah, that's, that's uh, I, I, that is kind of my mental list of things to check out when I get around to it. It's, uh, <laughs> well, you know what I mean? We all have, my coworker was just like, oh, so it's like, oh, you're doing his work too. So it's like, okay, fun. It's like, I'm not going to be looking at a thousand different models every month. It's like, I don't mm -hmm. have time for that. So <laughs> automatic forecasting in the interim, <laughs> it works, but it's not great. <laughs> mm. But we've all been there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I generally speaking, I, um, so just to get back to the other aspects of the, of the cross validation. I presume most of us uh, have a decent experience of it. Um, but I did see something when I was like searching online about the cross validation and why it is you want to use something like tenfold. And it, a lot of it seems to be about splitting up the data. But if you are doing bootstrap version, you don't need to do that, which is why the bootstrap works so well, um, because you are just creating redistributions of your data. But of course, the problem then becomes um, well, it's one about computation. And it is just, as John alluded to earlier, it's just quicker and easier to use normal k-fold cross-validation. And generally speaking, so long as your models aren't sequential, it's probably the best approach because it will save you time when you're trying to compare different modeling strategies, which is really a lot of what you do as a scientist, which is you'll compare different algorithms, decide which one's the best, and then you can then go off down the process of potentially using a bootstrap version if you once you find the model that you want to work on. Okay. All right. Anything anything else? With that, I think. Um Next week, presumably we'll go over the lab, but again, that's a, we'll see what Justin thinks. Um, and so we should wrap, we will wrap up chapter five one way or another next week. And then in two weeks we'll do six and uh, hopefully we can close out the year 
with six. So, um, cool. All right. I will see everyone in the chat. Thank you so much, Laura. Thanks.